Okay, finally got here on a Monday. Had all kinds of unbillable work to do this morning, as, w as well as some billable work here. Got calls in about who do I make sure and talk to when we're tying in a new water line and a new sewer line with the uh, town or whatever entity is responsible for those things. Uh, the water and sewer go to about the same place out here by the road, and we looked at that early in the series. I had a stake at the old corner of the, actually I can go inside, no I can't, that's gone too. It's, it's right about here. And we've got some root balls uh, like that over there, and there's that uh, cedar tree and stuff that was real close over there. So we're gonna get the backhoe on here today. Now that we're not knocking set, uh, sediment and silt type dirt down into the hole. Um, I might play with digging at those root balls. I might put it off. I'm gonna start trenching right through here. It came straight to about there, and then it went at an angle, and we were looking to try and miss it with the location of the pod, and it went out there to the street. So I'm gonna do my best to recall or find any last remaining orange paint at all. Oh, here's this stake. So it was from this stake through and over to the house over there. So anyway, we'll find it there. And I'm not sure I can dig deep enough with this backhoe all the way. I was thinking I needed to get down to eight feet, and that may be true at the road because we're going to go downhill here all the way. Uh, but it's going to start at about six because it was just at the bottom of the uh, excavated um, hole for the new foundation and then that's an eight foot wall that's two feet at least above the grade out here and so we can figure it's about six feet deep here so i'm going to dig a ways until i'm not able to reach it anymore scratching along aligned to it and at some point here i'm going to get these pallets of wood and stuff that are out of my way get, or, well we consolidated them i'm going to move it out back but i'm going to have to lay out and cut with the wet saw a piece of the driveway and then probably just chuck that asphalt into a pile for right now. Um, and it can go into one of these. The openings, the big openings where cribbing was way away from the foundation. I don't mind putting random stuff in like that. It'll pack up tightly and um, never break down. It's just good as hard fill. I don't like that stuff getting in close to the house. Just as the best practice, we wanna keep that engineered, certain amount of stone, certain amount of gravel soil, and try not to have any, um, even the little tabs broken off from the foundation. and and nails and stuff from the form boards kind of bug me in there. I know they're, they'll rust away, but try not to have any big stones or roots. I'm going to cut the old water line when I get there. That's copper. Um, and it goes out right here. I think they're basically in the same trench. So we're going to essentially work around existing water and sewer, using it as a guide to get all the way out to the road here. But then we get to a point where 811 painted my gas line on here for me. And so the water valve is there. We're not doing any road cutting, which is the sewer's in the center, which is where your manhole cover goes down. But he said right about here, when we had that sewer scoped, the problems with tree roots and everything sort of stopped, and from here into the road, into the uh, town's connection there, looks real good to him. So we're going to pursue this thing over here until, and we're going to inspect its quality or whatever, until we've got a reasonably good idea that the rest of it is nice and clear and open and worth connecting to, and then we'll get buckled into that. Uh, meanwhile, there's this other half of this tree. If it wanted to stop being breezy, I've got to be able to trust it. It's way over there. And so I just, there's no way to keep it from wanting to go over there. All the branches are off of it at this point, And it's right onto the main electrical supply to the house. And so I don't want to pull that down and short it. I mean, uh, to some degree, it's just over here. Quite a ways. And it does start to curve back away from it. I just wanted to get it. And as we stand here, it's going to hit the house and stuff. Brush down, smush down the face of the house. And so we've got some uh, splaining to do. We've got some thinking to do on that whole thing before we go just cutting away on it, which is why I paused on it before. But for now, I'll set up and watch us get started with this trench. See if we don't decide we got to cut into the driveway. I might do some head scratching and move these things out of the way first. Um, so just stay tuned.
All right, well, I got a 12 inch bucket and an 18 inch bucket for this machine. I think we're gonna just go get the 18 inch bucket right away. Um, I wanted to see what this is gonna be like, but that's gonna be what we want at least, if not more. Um, you still gonna have to get down in there and work. So I'm gonna be taking two bites with that probably rather than three or four with this. This is just Tinker Toy. Um, as far as, you know, which is to say just not enough dirt coming out of here for every scoop, that's for sure. So we'll run and get that, and that's going to require some simple stuff like a punch, hammer we've got over here, wrenches and sockets we've got over here. Just got to pull these pins that go through the actual pivots, pivot pins, so take the bolts and nuts off, slip those four bad boys out of there, pound these pins out, which should come out of there because I have greased it and one was frozen when I first got this and uh, I got it with the 18 inch bucket. Put this one on since then and has, haven't taken it off, but I think that they'll come right out of there. We'll throw the 18 inch bucket back on and then we'll go back to work here. Well, I gave up there yesterday after I noticed all this splatter and went looking and found this which I'd like to believe is the culprit I just put two fresh gallons in fresh gallons of high guard in this machine which are like I don't know twenty five dollars or more each uh, so there it is pissing it out on the ground if it is this which I'm gonna replace this one to start with it goes into an older sleeve this stuff is the new stuff so everything I believe everything in these I've replaced so far and so we'll just continue. The thing about a backhoe you want to be careful of is that you've got to have enough slack that you can articulate it, but not too much that you can accidentally get. Like these loops can actually choke through there and end up in there behind the cylinder and down in there and get pinched. Because the thing is you can gather a, you can gather a turn like this so hard that it's jammed because it's rubbery and then you know this can close and you can crack or bust it open where this that's not what happened here because this bend is protected from that sort of thing so anyway safest thing that i've been doing is to get the old one out and to make a copy the same length and then try to route it sort of the same way uh which sounds obvious but um if you don't know so for example i'm going to get this cover off and disconnect this guy up here at the control hub first and then when he's loose, I can start checking. I'm gonna have to loosen, loosen this like hold down and see if, see because this is a new hose and that's a new hose. But this I don't think is. Yeah, that's the new hose there. So that's a, no, those aren't. These are all like an older style end too, by the way. First thing somebody wanted to do was put a gates um, manufacturer end on here and the collar where it's crimped is so much thicker and it's considered an improvement for a lot but when I get under here you'll see uh, that they're so tightly packed to get to the control valves that you can't have a, a big um, body in this area of the hose or they won't be able to thread in between the other two um, another issue that I'm having is putting the bucket switch in the bucket I put all four new grease fittings on this tube and while these pins these pins have been pinned through here and through there. They have been definitely spinning in here because I've been articulating the bucket. Um, if these pins that go through the heavy pivot are broken, a lot of times that's because that, you know, someone hasn't greased the pin. Oh, here they are. Actually, this is where you grease out here. This is where you grease in there. And you want to be greasing that all the time because if it seizes and swells up with, or if it rusts and swells up with scale, even microscopically enough to seize in there, then it will break these off. And this will become one and the same as this. And this yoke out here will be pivoting around it here. Uh, but the longer you let that go without noticing, the more and more permanent the pin gets frozen in there. And then you've really got a fabrication project to figure that out. And so I'm glad I'm choosing to switch this bucket over now, a year or two after having done it the first time. I see these Harbor Freight Zerk fittings have probably taken the shit on me because they would have worked when I first installed them. I'll get some when I go get a hose from the store that manufactures um, hoses and other professional hydraulic stuff, they'll have some Zerk fittings that'll go the distance. I don't make a habit of leaving this in the weather to start with, um, 
And when I do, I put straight up grease from a grease gun and I'll slather it all over the hydraulic rams because if they get a little pitted rust, uh, the first time they're drawn in through this first seal, we'll scratch that seal and then they'll weep fluid and stuff all the time. So the game here is to get this thing to keep its fluid inside. It's expensive. It makes a, a mess. It's wildly unprofessional to be dumping it all over the ground here. We need the bigger bucket on. And so today's the day that we were gonna, are going to fight with this thing and tear it down far enough to replace a hose. We're going to out and get the hose, get some Zerk fittings, continue to beat this out. I've got a pin... Um, uh, Kerjigger thing that I use that we made my buddy Matt uh, welded this up for me when we did a pin I think I went through and pulled all the pins on this machine I'm fairly certain because I wanted to know when I first got it when I had a first window of opportunity to do that I wanted to know that they were all spinning freely and I wanted to be greasing them right along so this is the danger just a couple years all of a sudden it's frozen again if you're not careful about what you're doing so anyway i've got this thing and i'm blasting this one and this one out of there i need a bigger hammer i thought the sledge was over here but it isn't i started with a brass punch last night and then gave it up um because it wasn't moving i had the hammer drill my sds max drill or excuse me sds plus drill um the other thing i could do is go get the max i'd have to rent it i just keep skipping out on buying one or i'd just go get my own and come right back over here but the rental is annoying um but he would go right down in there and probably drive continue to drive that along i'd have to have a bit that would definitely fit and stuff so there's a bit of a so in, essentially i wouldn't mind making something for myself if i had the drill but i have to rent it so <sighs> i guess i had planned on switching the bucket when i got here and digging a little bit to see where that was coming from but it's just as it's idling here so i can manipulate this thing around it's pissing that fluid out so i'm going to get that hose pulled out and go and replace it first and then continue to try and switch this bucket out Well, we kind of lucked out there so far. That was relatively easy. In the past, I did, I guess it was this one where, I don't know, I felt like I had to go through that joint and keep going. It felt like a lot. I feel like this one is also new, but it doesn't look it. So anyway, we got the hose out. I can get, have them, you know, basically go in there and put, put it on the bench and say, could you guys please copy this exactly in terms of length? Um, it's quarter inch, I believe. Um, yada yada i put most of the tools away so that that's the next best thing uh without locking them i can hear the battery squealing on this so i'll get the keys out of it also and turn it off so we're not sucking the battery down while we sit here um the wrenches that i am using they can sit there if somebody wants to walk in here and take them in this town um they're a fucking piece of shit but still i'm gonna risk it because i don't want to pack everything all up nice and neat and come back and unpack it all out that's not efficient it's not really in plain view here so that's not a real big issue around here either so at least not in the middle of a work day. Uh, I've got that black wrap. Like, I cut that off. You see me start there. I have some more of that, so I'll grab that from the shop. I need a bigger hammer I'll grab from the shop. I need real penetrating oil I'll grab from the shop. We're going to get a real made in America or otherwise good quality um, Zerk fitting pack. And we're going to get a hose made. And then we're going to boogie back here and see if we can't put this together enough to dig for a while. 
All right, so I got a demo hammer rental with this nice heavy. It was a point, but I hacked that off. I talked that talked to them down there and said, you know, normally they'll put a point and a chip, a chisel in with it. I, I said, if you got a real old pointy one, you don't mind me cutting the end off. I don't want to go doing that before asking. Um, I do a lot of business with them, so I think that's why they were okay with that. Uh, I might have had to buy my own and do that if it were like a Home Depot situation. So those are the little things that keep you going back to the local independent place. Uh, there's all my fluid on the ground. Here's our new hose. Um, with this end, I forget the name of it every time, but this here is where, yep, it's where having two hands really fucking comes in handy. So this here is uh, where it's a smooth cylinder when you slide it over the hose, and then this is the, the physicality here is from it having been crimped on, which is what you need for this machine, because you come over here, and all these uh, nest, you know, the upper ones nest between the lower two um, connectors. You might get away with a gate's end on a lower hose, but I don't want to start messing with things here. This is the factory, you know, style that was on here. Essentially the same, which is what I keep doing here as I go. And it was a little over $100 for this hose and and for one new swivel end, which lets you install it without the hose getting all wrapped up and twisted um, from threading it in, which is an O-ring seal. This is the old one, and so as we go here, things get you know, replaced and they're brighter and I keep this thing indoors as much as possible and um, someday I may paint it or anyway it's doing a nice job for me I want to be taking care of it so now I'm gonna start by seeing because this is a half day rental and in order to get that I want to take it back there by the end of their work day which is just a few hours away so I want to check and see if this is gonna work for me or not or if it will work with a modification I want to be able to have the time to do that so that's how I'll budget my time here. So let's wail on that for a second and see if we can get it to act right. Okay, so you can see that worked like a charm. Um, this is again why, I mean, to get the Milwaukee battery version of this rotary hammer or demo hammer is like six, seven, eight hundred dollars, depending on how you, whether you get a battery with it or not. The next size down would have probably worked here, but I've got the next size down from that. I've got the inch and an eighth SDS plus hammer, chipping hammer. So it's like from him, I may skip the next level and invest in my own. This size I get probably once a year, if not twice a year on average. We used it here to break out the threshold to get started under the concrete in the garage that we turned into those sidewalk pieces over there earlier in the series. But um, <clears throat> hopefully that's just some weird crust crustable there. And I don't know why we got all that moisture. It's all oil there. Um, but up where the last place where it would be coming from is relatively dry so that's an interesting question anyway so now I'm gonna pop these four zerks out replace those make sure the new ones have got you know grease squirting down in there this is the issue here when I get it free uh, most of the diameter of both of these pins was free wheeling through there it's these ends where they're cross drilled for those pins you see I got to take down a lot of meat around these two holes and then whew, it just you know nothing but net right through and so that's where beating these in and out can swell the end of it up just a little bit and so you know in all of that literally hammer smashing it is worse on it than just putting now this would have been better if it was a cylinder rather than you know a clover in cross section probably uh, as well try to just engage with a similar diameter just enough smaller so that we don't risk jamming it in there would be a better punch tool for this um, but we didn't m m monkey these up too badly uh, so everything will work here, but this is the issue that you've got. You've got like a leathery 
uh, and in this case dry over here, you know, this should be slimy with grease. And at some point, I mean, that's how I was raised. Before you do out with the rakes or the tether or any of the farm equipment, you grease it. Uh, when Sean was here, all of his grease fittings had fresh grease on them. I see him run the grease gun at least once when he was here onto everything. You just get into the habit of it. Uh, this machine, I've done, a, I did this machine earlier this year. We did them here. And then there is one here on those two pins. This pin, you got to look sometimes to see. That's through there. Oh, there he is uh, on there. So you got to run this up. I think that's a Zerk fitting. Um, and so all these things are farm implements and construction tools. Very simple construction because everything's low speed, but it is heavily loaded and torqued. And steel on steel is a no bueno under any circumstances. So you got to keep them greased up. So I will do that. Um, speaking of which, I don't have the M18 grease gun. I got this old. Uh, vintage boy from growing up which I like to use but um, it's hard to commit the hand strength sometimes without jumping the end of it off the zerk fitting and so it'd be nice to um, be able to put I think the electric one makes things easier maybe maybe it doesn't anyway for now that's what we're doing it that way so I guess I'll take this right back um, and thank them and come back and throw it. We'll throw the hose in and the circ fittings on. We'll grease it up and we'll go back to work. We'll put the bigger bucket on there, which ought to go smooth. And uh, you guys can watch that happen.
All right, so I found the septic line. Um, <clears throat> I should not have put stone in this location at all. And it's just one of those things where I wanted to see the pile cleaned up and <clears throat> get the stone in first before any other debris and shit fell in here. But now digging this out, <clears throat> it's kind of always falling back in, falling back in. It'll stop eventually, but it's just annoying. So here's the sewer line. Where are we here? There it is. So you can hear it. Uh, here's the clay tile itself. There's a piece of it. Um, I had this exposed, but like I was saying, it uh, fills back in. Hang on a second. see it now I broke through it there there's a bell end there's another bell end there so it's in terracotta segments headed in and there's a weeper I felt it it's the corrugated tile like this is that's a little damaged but that's fine so somewhere in here so the wall is eight inches thick so the inside corner is about yay so there's a weep right there and then somewhere else there's a large diameter sleeve that we cast in for me to put the new septic line through. And so I'm pretty impressed with my backhoe. I've never checked to see how deep it'll dig, but that's over seven feet deep that I'm capable of. However, we're gonna go downhill, however slightly to the road, over 50 feet there. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get to it the whole way. So we may be in for a mini X rental. Um, which is a shame because it'd be nice to be able to do it with my machine, but uh, we don't need it on a partial day like today or something where we discover where things are and stuff like that. Once I've got a plan, I consider digging most of the way all the way along and then coming back with the mini axe, but the thing is you'll have dirt on either side of the trench that you'll have to drive up and over and uh, that'll be annoying. So I'd rather just work along digging to the full depth, exposing that pipe right along the whole way leaving the dirt anywhere I need to, because the nice thing about the Mini-X is he swivels 360, and then uh, not have more of a project. So let's be wise about what we can and can't do. It may seem logical to do everything I can with the machine I own, but I think it just makes more work. Um, it's relatively unsafe down in the hole, especially when you're not near an end. If you watch that movie on, I think it's on Netflix, the dig with uh, Ray Fines. You'll see what happens if somebody gets in to a trench and it falls, collapses in on you. So we don't want that to happen. And so, like I say, I think that weep is right here. If I dig it down, we've got our tile here again. On the inside. Cells. So I think we're like here at that weep. And so over here, another foot or less is this. See the teal side of it? Where is it? There. See the teal? That's our sleeve. That's where we're supposed to come through the footer. And we're only six inches or so down from the top of the footer before we expose that guy and where it may be. Two feet plus eight inches, so about 30 inches from that outside wall. Six inches down on the footer. Just eyeballing it. About to run out of battery here too, so forgive me if this clip comes to an end. Um, unscheduled end. I could get the battery back up and plug it all in. But then we're not getting things done here, see? This is the conflict of interest between content and 
productivity. So, let me go out here and go back down in the hole and we'll see if we can find that sleeve right before the footage cuts out. Oh, so I turned the machine off, it's not idling while I'm working because if I should be lucky, unlucky enough to have it collapse, but lucky enough to be able to yell for help, I don't want to have to do it over an idling machine. So I do what little bit I can. <laughs> if I end up trapped in here and dying, tell everybody I loved them. Um, so I think to the left, because like I say, eight inches, then two more feet is like over there is that new sleeve. So uh, I guess I'll just try and expose it here quick. I'm not sure where to put you yins guys. Maybe there is good. I don't know. There it is. There we go. There's our new sewer out. Okay. Our old sewer. But he's going kind of to this side of the trench and so is the water. If you come around here and look, notice that as I stand here, this guy's kind of headed in this direction. And so I got to move over with my trench. And you'll see the water probably went on this in the same trench, just a little higher. There's the old copper water ripped off. So we gotta start heading that way. So, uh, like I said, it's just at the tippy fingertips of what I can dig with in terms of depth. And so I think we're in for as efficient of a mini X rental as we can be. Of course, it would be more efficient if I could go and get it with my own truck. I think we'll probably have to have it delivered here if we're gonna do that. Or we could push pause on the sewer rebuild while we work this weekend on putting the truck back together again and see if we can get that far supposed to have our heads back from the machinist Friday and oh yeah not all our gaskets though all of our gaskets to get everything put back together again I got to go back out an hour away and then an hour home to the place I got the heads from the guy because my rocker covers my valve covers are bolted down in the center and the, my heads had bosses for that now the heads I got have bosses on the outside edge right in the gasket edge basically for those rocker covers so since he sold me those heads because he upgraded his heads to aftermarket I, I noticed he already had aftermarket rocker covers I don't know why I didn't offer or inquire about them when I was there so basically I'll get his rocker covers that I know will fit right back on his heads and the machinist did the work on what year and what model number for the Felpro gaskets for the rocker covers what head gaskets I need and there's another gasket that I need. Oh, intake manifold. And so he was really certain of all those, so I got those coming, but they're not, not going to be here until Memorial Day itself, at least. So this Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think it's probably, I don't know, we'll look and see. Either I'm going to get a mini X or I'm going to, uh, either I'm going to have it delivered or I'm going to go and pick one up with the truck and see what else I could be accomplished this weekend, or this week. Tuesday, today. So we got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. To get stuff done around here uh, I'll get back to you all right we got this cord dang dingling now but um, indeed I can't get a mini X until next week so it's Tuesday and so it'll be next week at some point hydraulic fluid on everything here um, <clears throat> and so I'm parked outside where we were with the digger I just came in that can sit there for now um, I started thinking I could build the main sewer stack down from there, go over, and you know I had thought about going right along the footer, but of course the corrugated drain, footer drain is right next to it anyway, so then it's like what's the point of being right immediately next to that, plus all my stuff's here, plus uh, we're off the wall by that much, I guess. So essentially... I'm gonna be about that much on trench. I guess I will have to move this stuff up. Trench over here with stone, turn and trench over here to where I'm right underneath the sewer stack and go down. 
And then I think that if we're gonna put a toilet underneath this basement stairs, it'll be a T here, and it would go straight through underground to the other side of this footing and immediately turn and roll up and be a flange here, which will put you under the high side of the basement stairs. Maybe over there a little bit, but we gotta see, we gotta plot up the stairs roughly to know sort of in there if you're gonna be under the stairs with a toilet. Um, and then alternatively, and then we're gonna come over here and bend and go that way, but that would mean that I could take off of that big diameter with like two inch and run over here and up to get the washer and the slop sink over here, which I think is gonna be in this corner. Uh, we could always push down to inch and a half for the slop sink, but the washer's gotta be two inch. Um, I'd like to be in the wall with a typical washer, washing machine, like assembly. So will I notch out the footer for that? Probably. Um, I don't think it's worth like trying to drill in from the side and from the top down and keep a piece of concrete across the top. I'll just um, cut into it with my wet saw, gas saw, you know, half a dozen to a dozen times in that location as deep as I can before I touch the wall. And then I'll just snap those all off and I'll end up with, I may have to chipping hammer out the bottom corner of it, but I'll be able to roll up and come inside of what will end up being the framed wall here for that, which will keep it nice and clean and straight going over, make a left and go right out. I'd consider it being tight, but then you got to roll over and line back up with that sleeve. So we'll just keep it here with the sleeve. And so that will get all of our downstairs drains, I think. Worst case scenario, we change our mind for, with the toilet location and we want it in that alcove, in which case we can just come around the corner, run over here and, and connect up to it there. However, before I go trenching that out with stone, I almost want to, it's going to be having to, I'll have to overdig the stone to get down to the depth that I want. Um, it'll be deeper over there and practically, you know, you'll be able to see it over here in this, in these areas here to keep it with a downward angle. Um, <clears throat> but then I started thinking, well, I'd like to get a plumb bob off the center line of the stack, which means I got to take the old beam out of the way, which means I have to pop all the electrical off of it, which I got this far to do. But then I didn't realize how closely, see, we're touching the wall over. I can't go left with the new beam anymore. Um, and I got to get up there. I should have taken those that armored cable off beforehand, but no, no matter. I have to have the ball joint discombobulation tool or pickle fork, a lot of guys call them. Anyway, because the ball joints on the STI are about shot. So this works actually perfectly to go right up on either side. Where are we here? Like that little guy there. I'll go right up on either side with the, the power of the inclined plane. And I'll drive him up on either side of that and then lever out using the strength in that armored cable and pull that off of there. All in an attempt, or a, you know, the idea being that I can then cut this beam up into like five or six foot long pieces, and I don't know why it's actually not hanging down worse. Um, I guess they probably did toenail the joists into it, so those are all happening. But basically, oh, I got all the um, roofing nails off of the cold air return flange on this side. Uh, there probably are some over on this side, but they'll just have to tear because I can't get up there to separate them. However, the new beam ought to hold the reinforce it so we don't just keep tearing it down in theory. So I'm gonna hang up the camera over here and then work behind the beam where you can't see at all what I'm doing to tear those electrical uh, clips back down. And we'll get set up here for that and do maybe a time lapse.
Okay, that probably got us to the end of the day there. Um, I was being really careful of this armored line because it's like, it seems like you could just rip it all down and install all new, but like, it's fine. And I'll probably use a lot of it because we're going to try and save some cost here, some phase one cost, and putting all the electrical back the way it used to be, except for things like this, which are just stupid. Um, but this here is also... A tangle convoluted mess. This is why I've been making sure, maybe you saw me in the time lapse, I don't know, that uh, the main is on, main breaker, pushed to the inside, and the garage is pushed to the inside. This guy's popped, but everybody else is thrown out from the center and off because of all the, of all the circuits that 10-3, uh, which is a heavier gauge wire for 220 volts, was right in there. I didn't even feel it. I cut it off clean. Uh, there it is. That goes over here. It was there that I cut it off. It went over into this junction for some reason and over to this outlet, which is where the washer was or the dryer, whichever. I think probably the dryer. Um, so we'll have to be rebuild that. However, to some degree, we were going to have to anyway because I don't like to have a junction box on such a heavy circuit like that. So, good thing he was cut off or they probably would have uh, scared the shit out of me at least and destroyed my saws all potentially and could have uh, injured me although I'm on a fiberglass ladder so um, probably would have just destroyed the saws all um, I might have just popped the breaker I don't know I like to avoid cutting through electrical when I can I certainly want to try to avoid cutting through 220 so we got the uh, old main beam pieces all sitting over here they can get fired out through the window one of these days and thrown away but you know the more I'm thinking about if you saw me stand here looking it's like, we could get, we could replace this beam quick. Like if I came in here with some two by tens, which I have laying around 16 footers, um, and made three layer, a three layer beam from just inside the wall to just inside that wall, and went right on the pier, one, two, three with my shores, and went up and took the weight off of this over here on this side, uh, then I'm free to see if I can't get some help and slide it back out of here and have the steel guys bring me something taller by three inches, um, which it could definitely be there and over there too, because that's about what's in there. But if I got something taller by three inches and potentially heavier, I want to check with the architect and see if I could skip. I mean, that's the heavy post because this is the outside wall, so it's probably not. I'm married to these piers, but wouldn't it be cool if I could move the heavy guy right here to this center of this pier and come up with such a thicker and taller I-beam that we would use the whole pocket in the concrete and we could skip the frequency of these posts. Uh, I was just rushed to get this replacement in here. I was rushed to tell them what size pockets to make in the door and it just kind of irritates me and it's unpolished and at this point we could still swap it pretty effectively. If they brought me something, they could take away what I didn't want, probably for a wash and trade it back. So I'll have to call and ask what it would take um, to do that anyway just something that's rolling around in my head but for now I can see um, all the electrical and I've got that old beam cut out of the way and what was the point of that oh now I can cut off the um, plumbing stack which can now come straight down and uh, huh. looks like the double joist had to be this is all kind of convoluted here uh, these joists aren't getting to the beam, so I might strip a lot of this stuff out and sister over onto the beam at least here, get all this electrical down tomorrow, cut that zigzag out of there, take that uh, hot air supply out because he's not going to function anymore at least in that location, clean this all up here. I may come over while I'm at it and uh, take out the stair way that's left and if I can get underneath I'm just gonna move over here with one of my shores and get under a joist here with the u-shaped head which I got to get from home right now it's got a flat head I have what's called like a u-shape for my shore like that which that way I feel better about it being underneath the joist centered but still having some like flange on either side and I'll take some weight off of this post and go up and uncover that which I assume is just well, no. See, that plate over there is flush. No, 
He's additional to the joist height. So anyway, I'm sure that's just more plate. I'll pull that fascia thing off there, get the cable out of there, get all this crap pulled back and out. And we could start with, you know, we gotta get our LBL and sister those joists that I said didn't make it to the beam and stuff. So that's all stuff we can do tomorrow. And so for now, we're gonna call it a day, take some batteries and uh, get them charged up for us. Hit this thing again in the morning, we'll see you. All right, we dropped that yesterday at the end of the day, but we're here today to pick things back up again inside while we wait for a solution out there. Um, and right to start with, I want to solve some of these or repair some of these structural things that are like questionable at best. Um, it's, it all has to do with this stairwell, essentially. Uh, let's see here. This joist here that's the tail end of that half and they pass over this beam here this joist makes it onto the new beam and all the rest of them do prior to that behind us and then we got this one who's been cut short here and headed off so he's the end of him is being carried by a joist that's on the beam on one side and it being headed off to a joist that's headed off again before being on the beam, which is an issue in my mind. None of this is going to like fall through like a cartoon, but while I'm down here dealing with all this, uh, these issues here, i got to pull this register end out, and I'm going to get this thing cut up. But notice the hub on the upper elbow is like above the plane of the subfloor. So right to start with, I want to cut this thing off here. The one is just the tail end of what was used to be a joist here. So I'm going to rip him off entirely and cut this joist off at least flush here just to open this space up between that and get rid of that heat thing, get it out of my face, get this block down and this electrical box cut and pulled back out through there. And then I'm going to probably get this block that's got some random spike like missing the joist, get that block and that other block that isn't even one whole block like cut out of there. And so the, the you know the the idea being that we get this area and the stair and stuff everything all out of here to start over again with a fundamentally correct structural um, foundation to bring a stairway back down into this basement again as well as um, you know remediate some of this questionable stuff where these additions and stuff were done I'm gonna get this other sill plate pulled down. And therefore, maybe even the rest of that one, which does continue out that way, it continues out onto that wall. And so we want to be careful that we're not, um, you know, carrying, I mean, it is, basically, these joists jump over to their rim joist in there somewhere, or maybe not. I don't exactly know. I'm going to poke around. I'm going to get that insulation out of there. But we're just going to see, maybe these joists, actually... They line up. No, see, I thought for a second there that that could be all one full stick, but I mean, it's already 16 feet practically. So that's, I mean, there's no way that's a 22 foot two by eight, I don't think. But we're going to get underneath there and poke around and see. No, see, there's blocking and stuff. So we got to get some stuff down and out of our way and start amassing basically another load of crap for, uh, for the dumpster or a dump trailer taken to the to the dump. Um, <clears throat> this two by six could come off the ceiling here. Just some things that weren't pressing issues or were, were weren't worth addressing when we were in the old basement that we will address now. We'll get this board situation off. We'll uncover and open this up over here. Uh, we'll get the U-head on that shore over there. We're gonna just start with this type of stuff and make sure that um, that we get all of it correct because it's where you would frame a house when it was new you would get this correct and then you add systems I'm not going to come in here and start adding plumbing and electrical systems to framing that's questionable uh, because then they're laced all throughout it like this has been the case here for some time and you couldn't come down here and easily make these repairs not to mention trying to turn around and get lumber and stuff in and out of here um, or set up and work down in what used to be here so that wasn't possible before but it is now and so that's the tack that we're going to have um, and try to open things up here and get um, ready to kind of rebuild the systems down here.
Okay, I went and got another shore and my U-shaped heads for them. And this 8-foot beam that I kind of leave kicking around made of 2x10. Because uh, he's handy and not as, wouldn't be as handy to take him apart completely. There's no point. So that's nice to have around. I'm going to go from... So I got that sill off and stuff. There's a 3 quarter inch board in there to add thickness. Or it was the old sheathing boards of the house on the original outside that they left in there. It's just sloppy. And um, I'm not exactly sure. What I'd really like to do is, see, this joist, turn up my headlamp here, this joist gets onto the beam. So he's in pretty good shape. So it's the next one, one, two, three is back here before four gets all the way to the beam again. So one, two, three are really the questionable folks that we're gonna try and do something about here. And so I'm, you know, essentially under them, I'm gonna to have to cut that three-quarter inch board up to the plane of the joists. Over here in this section, they use two by 10, so that's also gonna to have to be cut up to two by eight thickness, one, two, and three, and so that everything's coplanar. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that, like right in the center of the house here, and towards the outside wall of the old house, that we get these joists sistered up and back onto the new beam, and cut all of this other blocking and crap out of the way. So I'm going to set up and attach these, and then tip it to the side and get the shores on it, and then Ed and I see if we can't get it. I'll make a measurement here so that we're not too tall when we get up there, but I'll make sure that we're just under what we need for overall height, and together we'll stand this thing up as a unit, and I'll take up the slack until it's snug, and then we'll go up until we've got everybody basically coplanar and then I can gut this area with kind of like reckless abandon.
Okay. Got all that mess cut out of there. What I've got here now is this joist fully on the beam. And then we're short one, two, three. And then we're back on the beam over here. So we need three sticks. Now, this one has only got to get to the beam, but the other two, one, two, have got to get, I want to get them to the edge of what used to be here for a landing before the stairs. They can always be cut back some from there. I don't want to commit to cutting the uh, landing back any more than it ever was right now, and I won't miss a little bit of lumber if I cut it off later. <clears throat> so I'm going to go get three two by eight sticks. Um, and it's nice to have, so like from there to the outside wall is about <clears throat> maybe like 12 feet, 13. And so it's nice to have two thirds of the length. Um, so I'm gonna just go with 10 footers. So they'll slide out their start here and wherever they peter out down there will be fine. This one will be slid even further. I might get two tens and an eight, you know, because like, that's probably easiest. Two tens and an eight. Now I got problems here because I've got an electrical penetration that I can't get around there, so he, I clipped him off right there. And so I'll f feed him out so I could be on our side here of this joist. I'd like to be on the same side of all of these um, if I can. And so the far side of the room, those joists are on our side of these joists. That's the ends of them that pass. And so if we go back to that layout with these sisters, um, it's probably a best practice instead of going to the far side of them. Then we've got Joyce at three different layouts in here rather than two different layouts by the side of the house. So that's my rationale on that. And so that means like this piece of bridging has to get cut out and that piece has to get cut out, which isn't the end of the world because this is the shorter span on this side of the house anyway. The bridging isn't doing much for bounce over here. Um, and so I'll run out and get those and get them in and attach them down the sides here. It's going to be four fasteners, four nails shot in every, because it's a two by eight, so we use four nails every 16, 16 inches or so um, is, is the way you do that. Um, and then once they're in, I can take this loop down, this bearing loop that we, temporary loop. Um, no battery saver, huh? So anyway, and then I can have these shores back, which I'll feel better about coming over here. I just threw this uh, permanent column into a temporary position right here as well because I noticed that like the stairwell has got no joist there. One, two, three, and then there's a full joist, but then immediately the next one has a huge bite out of it for um, heat, which is why they had trouble here and there was like a lolly column there and a lolly column there and this big like cracking, broken um, um, uh, plank, because it's so thick trying to desperately to hold this area up because it's just too light to be collecting all that load. So I'd like to get this piece probably cut off there and take the rest of it away and uncover this plank and uncover that solid joist and clean them all up on the sides. And uh, I don't want a sister on the far side of them because that's right into the stairwell again. But I cut all those nails off and come down here. The problem is, oh no, there aren't any electrical penetrations in there, which is nice. So I'll get this two by six off. But there's nothing, I thought these wires, sorry, were going through that, but they're not. They just turn and go upstairs. Ooh, I don't know if there's room. Well, I don't have to get to the sill. I could start at the first one there and sister all the way along that and all the way back up to the beam, which will be really nice to have in there either way. Um, and I could even sister this second one too. Yeah, I will because I'm going to take that notch out. So I'll go right from that same kind of length over to here. You know, so I could get those. Those are probably 12s. So get like two 12s, two 10s, and an 8. Come back and be ready to do that. But I'm not ready to rip this all down and continue to compromise this whole region of the house. We're going to work to the one side of the beam, get it right, turn around and do the other side. But then um, we'll have things really nice and clear and professional in here when they were just... Look at all this shit blocking and nails and toenails and spikes and all this stuff it's like that's the old beam but like all this trash just was because all you had back in the day you didn't have any shores all you had were you know hands was a handsaw and and, and i had to hand nail stuff in so you needed room to swing the hammer and j you just end up doing hack job work so we'll get this little area fixed up okay so 
New day, went and got some lumber, work car. We got uh, a 12 up in here already. Like I said, um, those are the ends of the joists that are complete coming from the far side. And on our side of the house, they're on the right-hand side here. And so, figure... <clears throat> Sistering on our side of those over there puts the new piece uh, on the same layout that this side of the house is on. Just if it's just a best practice. I don't. I, I've been in circumstances where I'm replacing subfloor and different things, and I've got to find where my joist is, and um, if I'm using a reference, and then I've got to move over. It just becomes annoying. So, uh, as far as how to pick what side, that's a good way. I also had to clear out all the bridging and stuff that was over here on that side of the joists. I pulled the electrical wires and stuff out and I checked for nails. There were a couple of different nails from old stuff, but you get up here, whoa, and you fall down the ladder. <clears throat> and I can't turn my flash on, I figured out. Anyway, you can see all these nails coming down from the subfloor boards that used to be coming through into the joist. So I'm gonna, and they just stop right there. So I'm gonna quickly buzz those off with the sawzall, and then we'll roll this guy. He's sitting on the new beam and on my temporary beam over there. We're gonna roll him up. I can't do it here because I haven't got to roll him up like that. Smash him into place. Um, it won't hurt that these aren't nailed into it. Now that's a good, you know, question because could I cut along the top of that old one all the way with a sawzall and tip him over and pull him out and completely replace him with one joist to, to, to go the full distance? Yes. Um, would I consider that if this was my flip house or my house and I knew I was going to go through and renovate the kitchen, you know, because it's linoleum and stuff now, and I'd remind myself, that, you know, I could nail it down at that time. Yeah, but there's really no harm. It's going to be more work to do that. And uh, I'm not going not gonna to bother with it here. Uh, the subfloor will remain attached to that all the way to this point, and we'll just need some more attachment onto this, another foot or two, a couple feet here, um, which is better than taking all the attachment away, replacing the joist and this one and the next one, and having essentially one of the highest traffic areas of the house in front of the refrigerator between the stove and the fridge and the sink, all without any attachment. It would just be really creaky. Um, could I put a bead of subfloor glue on this? And like when I smoosh it in, would that be in there kind of? Yeah, I mean, you could get real tricky here, but that's not the nature of this project. We're going to get things done in a way that they could be supplemented in the future. Um, and we're not going to cut corners, but we're also not going to go to extra work. So just know that that's an, op you know, an option here, which is nice because, see, the, the supporting lifting beam there has got you covered for several joists. And so you could work on, we could do this to all of them. So I'm going to choose to do this much, no more right now. Uh, we're going to go that far, you know, far enough that way to where we're completely under the existing landing. <clears throat> and if we cut the existing landing back, we will do that. I doubt that we'll make it any longer because we're going to crowd our old headroom. Uh, the old stairs were steep, if anything, so we're going to drag the stair out longer. And I don't want to get any closer to the wall at the bottom of the stairs. That's not a best practice either. We've got two feet here before the beam and almost three before the actual basement door. Well, we got, yeah, a little under two feet before the beam and about two feet before we get to the basement door. All of this floor basically to there could um, be taken away if you didn't have a door. See, the door wants to open into the basement, and I believe you can't clean the person off the top stair with the door when it swings in. So you gotta have some amount of landing here. And so I'm gonna stick to what was here to see if we can't get it grandfathered, because we're gonna have to have pass codes and stuff here too. So again, for now, this is how we're making the toys. Let me cut these nails off. I'll slam these couple 12 footers in. I'll put the 10 next door, um, or the eight next door. What's the 10 for? Uh, Two twelves, an eight, huh, forget where I got the ten, two twelves, a ten maybe, for there, and an eight, <laughs> anyway, I'll remember what I was thinking when I get into it. All right, I just got done having a meeting quick with the building inspector and um, discussing what to do here, see, because I specifically got those 12s, 
because I knew we'd have a real, like, plenty of engagement here, and I could pull them out to what we had for an existing landing, right? And we could keep that landing in case we want to cut it back later. won't be a big deal. Or, um, <clears throat> you know, if I were to plan on cutting it back, like in this case here, and then wish that I hadn't or wanted it longer or something stupid or at least this long or whatever, then we have another situation where we've got a third uh, layer to reach back out again, just messy and shitty to start with. So before I shoot all this up with nails uh, and can proceed to, you know, take this down, move it over here onto this side, start working over here, I want to know where I've got to be with the ends of these. And so I hung a plumb bob off the landing, got a sense of where it was on the floor here, and a distance from there to the fire foundation wall, which of course is going to come toward us uh, over four inches because we got to have insulation and framing and whatever. <clears throat> so I have a certain distance here. Then you look at what you've got. I set up the laser, okay, and I hang the tape down from the threshold and I get a distance to the laser line. And then I come over here and I set the tip of the tape on the footer and I get a distance up to the laser line and I add them together I have 108 inches. Now we're going to plan on at least a four inch concrete pour if not one inch of foam going over there first so it may be even five inches so 103 104 inches of total rise to do where we can't go any higher than like eight and a half inches or eight and a quarter or something like that for a step height which is kind of tall. And they were tall before, but I'd rather be closer to seven or so. So anyway, I start taking the 104 and dividing it by, you know, 14, 13, 14, 15 steps or something. And start seeing that that rise for each step starts looking close to a fractional amount. So close to your 125, 0.125, which is an eighth. 0.25 is a quarter. 0.375 is three eighths. 0.5 obviously is a quarter. 0.625 is a five eighths. Anyway, I'm start looking for a step height that's close to a fractional size and within what's allowed. And so we found what about 14 steps at about seven and some inches. I forget the math right now. But if you're going to do 14 steps down at that height, they can't be any. They have to be at least nine inches deep, and I'd like 10. Plus 10 makes for a round number. So we start looking at like 14 steps at 10 inches deep is 140. Anyway, we're going to be way too close to the wall down here. There won't be anything left. It's just asinine to step off this close and have to turn. It doesn't make any sense. Long story short, we're going to take that landing away. We're going to take the landing away at, if we're going to do it at all. Um, we basically, as it stands, if you notice the doorway up there, you notice the hinges, right, on that side. You notice that the stop, which is that, I can't indicate the stop, but it's that heavy vertical shadow that's on there because the door closed like this and was a left-handed in-swinging door to the stairwell, like that. And so you can't come to the top of the stairs and get knocked backwards by someone throwing the door open in, in your face. If you have an in-swinging door at the top of the basement stair, you've got to have enough of a landing to provide for that space that the door swings, whatever, 36 inches or something they want, I believe. So, if we're going to take the landing at all, we can no longer have a door at the top of the stairs, which all the time that I've known uh, Ed and his wife, there hasn't been a door there. Probably because this has been racked out really badly, high on the left, low on the right, and the door stopped swinging or jammed on the floor or otherwise, whatever, whatever. So, they've lived without it for a long time. I'm going to double check with them that they can live without it for forever, um, <clears throat> or at least until we pass inspection. But it is a safety hazard, and it's a good, it's a good rule to have. So... We're going to probably take this, we're going to take this landing back. Therefore, I can take the 12s that I put in here, and 10 wouldn't have made it anyway to here if I slid them all the way to the outside rim joist, which is what I've done. And I think that that's nice. Uh, it cleans up the look of the staggered end. Yes, it may create, you know, an extra deep hole that has to be drilled, like in the case of running this outside water, you know, whoop de doo i got to drill through two layers. I've got the setup for that. It's no problem. So... I'm going to take all of that, and there'll be doubles, and they'll go, you know, the last four inches to the main beam um, as doubles. And it, I don't think it's going to hurt anything there. I'm probably going to double up this one as well, because it, if you notice, is actually a beam that carries this outside corner. Those, those were installed as 2 by 10s They've got to be ripped up because uh, they hang down below the plane of this framing. Um... And so this is a beam also, because these die into that. And so we'll probably end up with a double here, and that's a double already, but I'll trim him up. I'll probably, oh, he looks all rotten. Well, he's been wet. This was a crawl space area here. And so 
I'll probably end up with putting hangers on those, potentially, just to tighten and solidify all that stuff. But this is where, you know, I had to talk to the building inspector before I could really decide how far, to, where to place these and what size lumber to use, uh, because the next step is nailing it all in, like I was talking about. Four inches, or four fasteners every 16 inches, and then I can take this down and move the shores and use them somewhere else and move on. Right now they're being used here, and I need them there until I've decided. So... No big deal, you just gotta be kind and say, can somebody shoot over here quick and we'll have this conversation? So, blah, 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 I know what I'm doing. Let's attach those and keep this train moving. Okay, I went and got another couple 12 footers and I got this one in here, which, um, it doesn't appear tight there, but it's tight to this joist here. So, it's just doubling a joist on this side for the sake of it being a beam here and this being the original sorry beam there because of the ends of those and then this being the original outside wall of the house it's it's a there's a hole in the floor here um the engineer and the architect want me to have a beam under this old edge of the house all the way over there which is where we're going to put a couple layers of glue lamb on that joist but going that way it's the same situation and we don't have any pier or any post or anything it's just doing that span over there and it's a shorter span here than here uh but it's not going to hurt anything so we made it beefier it, we're right here right now it sounds good let's do it and so then the fourth one is for this shorty here the problem with that is that is directly lined the to sister onto that side to our side of it like we've done on all of these slams right into the end of this joist because all the joists on this side of the house are on the right hand side or the sister side of the joist over there so joist over there we come to the right hand side with the sister and bang we're right into the end of this joist so um first i thought about you know it only needs to have it only needs to be on a bearing as far as is it as it is wide so an inch and a half onto this bearing would be enough so i could reach up in there because he's flush over here and i could cut back with the sawzall and the oscillating tool to where there's an inch and a half or two inches or something inch and three quarters onto the two by four plate on this beam and then take a measurement to the rim joist over there and make this piece so that it goes along here and just sits right in and sisters over right there so there was that but then out of curiosity i wanted to check and see that the beam is straight because if i want to straighten this beam i mean he may wiggle down the course here because we only just got things in here enough for sean to get out of here they haven't been dialed so i took a measurement from the outside wall so this is a shorter span and i'm by myself so i could hang the tape out uh more reliably to this way so i did from you know the flange to the concrete wall there flange to the concrete wall over here and this is an inch greater and so i may want to bring that over an inch when we get everything all dialed up in here and so if i'm playing it if i'm cutting this back to where there's an inch and a half or even inch and three quarters something on this plate once i yank that over and i yank this over i'm diminishing what i've got for for purchase there and i don't want to start doing math and counting on it to be correct and all of that <clears throat> therefore this is all the uh, sisters I'm comfortable installing without coming over here to modify. So again, this is the one that I'd run right into the end of, but you come down here and it's got a notch out of it. So it's going to need to be sistered anyway. So uh, I'd probably put it on this side because to add it inside, I can't actually fasten through it because I can't get a, fa a device in there because it's so tight to that last joist. And I start looking at that last joist and I see that it's the actual edge of the stairwell here. Now, when you have a stairwell in a building or in a structure like I'm used to working on, at least residential stick-built construction, you've either got, I mean, it's load-bearing. So a lot of times it comes right on down to the foundation on both sides. It's a big column that's walled all the way up and up and up. But in the case of this house, we get down here into the old basement. It used to have columns, but the new one, it's just a big hole in the floor system, the first floor system. So... <clears throat> This is where they want to see a beam because it's the old outside wall of the house. But over here, I've still got an interior wall here. And on the stairway upstairs, there's an interior wall on your right. And etc. It's all loaded out here. And so we're on this one little floor joist from the beam to the outside wall. 
and he's a two by eight. And, uh, you know, there was a big slab, that big white thing that's like almost three inches thick. It's at least two inches thick or more. Uh, yeah, it's almost three inches thick. And it was cracked and it had a column, a lolly column under it <clears throat> because they were having problems right here. It was installed right there. So right there. And I tested it and it was loose so I ripped it down. But <sighs> there's a split happening right here. Basically, I want to add at least another layer, if not two, to that. But right to start with, I've got, I mean, this was notched over here to turn up with um, hot air, which is in the way of doing that. Then you come down here, and all this electrical goes upstairs right next to it. So if I try to sister in here, it's going to slam into all of those. So before I'm willing, and now this is the one that's on layout. See the same kind of spacing across and then they wanted the stairwell there, so they put another one there. So that's actually X additional. This is the original layout joist. So, I mean, in a perfect world, that would be basically solid. It, it would take three more layers to make it solid, um, which would make it a five-layer beam going across. It wouldn't hurt anything. Um, it's a bit heavy duty. So to start with, we need one additional layer on it. Uh, and I may not do the whole five layer thing, but I need one layer. And this electrical stuff is in my way. So I think my new plan before going any farther, because while this is working over there to support everything, I don't have a lot of extra support here. I've got the permanent column kind of on there for... Nothing's looked like it's saggy or anything to me here, but this is all just an abundance or, or a, um, a, yeah, abundance of safety or whatever they call it. So I'm thinking I want to take this out or at least cut it back to there because this is useless and that being heavy or this full thickness again is basically doing nothing over there. So I'd like to cut him free and off to there, if not take it completely out of there. And if I'm going to do that... I'm compromising this area, even if it's just a little bit. And if I'm compromising this area, I'd really like to have this system underneath it. And in, have, in order to have this system underneath it, I need to be done over there. And to be done over there, i got to put that last sister joist on. And to put that last sister joist on, I need to cut this out of the way, because the end of it's interrupting over there. And to cut this out of the way, I want to put that system, this temporary load-bearing system over here. And around and around we go. So... Uh, uh, to avoid having to make a decision there, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move this electrical over so I can slide in and add a layer to this first joist on our side of it here first. Um, all I've got to do is I'm going to go up and I'm going to drill. Come on now. I'll drill to the far side of each one of those penetrations with the same side, a three-quarter inch bit or something like that. Uh, near to the hole and then I'll just cut over to it with the oscillating tool carefully and just make a pill shape so that when I come sliding through with the second joist I can just move those things over and we can leave this armored cable wherever it may go we're still gonna have to cut it free down here and go to junction boxes and stuff but I don't want to cut things off and start pulling scope expanding the scope of the project up into the first floor of the house and stuff unnecessarily so I'll come over here I'll drill those and open them up so the electrical can be moved over I'll pull that handful of it you can't see that handful of cable, a coaxial cable wire out of there. I'll make sure it's clear over in there. I'll take these few clips and stuff off. I already pulled that block down. I may have to do the same thing here where that wire goes upstairs that you probably can't see because of the exposure. All those nails have got to be cut back. And then I can come over on this side and I can send a new 2x8 down the side of that and double it up from the beam to the outside wall and then with confidence I can either cut this to there or take the whole thing down and replace it with a solid one in which case yeah see one way or another I got to get the electrical out of it because it goes through there but it's kind of janky anyway I mean somewhere here yeah it goes from going through it to coming down and sticking onto the face which is it's one or the other folks not both so this is how we have to sit here and scratch our heads and think before acting, because it's kind of the end of the day, and I'm off tomorrow until then it's the long weekend, and I don't want to go in a rush to create, um, you know, 
visual progress and then kick myself later. So I think the best case scenario today is to clean up this side of that first joist on the stairwell hole as much as I can so that you can put a two by eight up there. That'll take a 16 footer or the better part of it, which I don't have and can't get with the car. It's getting too long to get with the car. But I think we're gonna sister all of these floor joists because it's almost, it's 15 feet anyway. And doing that with a two by eight, it just makes for a spongy floor. So we're gonna end up getting a bunch of those anyway delivered. And I found where I can get a glue lamb that I can cut two seven and a quarters out of it because the seven and a quarter glue lamb is a really small glue lamb or LVL, laminier, uh, uh, laminated veneer lumber, which is how we're going to build the beam the ar architect wants here. So I called all around this morning looking for that size and it was going to be special order or um, pretty pricey. And then I realized, well, I could cut two out of a 16 inch wide stick, 16 feet long. And that'll make them a little over $100 each, $102 or something, $103 each, which is really affordable. And they'll probably end up on either side of this joist because I could put one up on this side and uh, screw or nail through him into that joist. Do the same on this other side, screw or nail into that, and uh, we'll have built what we need here all well out of the way of the actual stairwell. So you can always fur over there to catch and carry drywall if you want, but it's not immediately right in your face if you don't want it to be. And to get this done, I want to be able to get this post out of here and uncover this whole area. So underneath this floor over here or somewhere here, I want this temporary bearing loop to work on that. So we've got to get done here and get done here, and then we can go over there. And then, <clears throat> you know, middle of next week, we'll be done with these major first floor structural improvements. So then we can get down to the floor with the types of posts in the right locations that we should be in and then push up with my shores and install those posts so that this is nice and level as well as straight, as well as the same distance from the far wall and, and the floor around the stairwell is well constructed and appropriately built. <clears throat> and then we'll be in a position to find out whether we can resume digging the septic outside. And that's just a factor of order of operations here. We don't want to just go smashing and and cutting and installing. And, you know, I've got some sticks that I'll take back because I was thinking one thing. And then um, in the interest of staying moving, I went and got lumber and came back with it and then changed my mind, did a few things here, but ultimately went out and got different lumber. But in the end, what's going to be installed, what you're going to put your name on, what's going to be left here to do the task for the rest of time is important. So if you got to change your mind and switch something out while you still can, I suggest that you do it. That's the way that I work. I'm not just over here, you know, somebody had 2 by 10s or thought it was 2 by 10s or, oh, we could notch them and it'll work. Yeah, but it just looks janky and it makes work for somebody else who wants to pick up and go with what you did. So we're just not going to do that on this project. Um, no problem. We'll keep working along here. You know, I just spent 45 minutes telling you about what I was going to do here. And then I get up here on the ladder to cut some nails off, and I see this fucking joist is also notched. I guess I turn my light on, maybe. I mean, this, the two joists, you get back here and look and see what it is that you're actually doing here. That means that both of these joists are severely compromised, which is why somebody thought they could add that big slab and put that post under it and shit that all just broke because the post was driving in the center of the slab and it was unsupported. I mean, it would have it would have worked if you could have blocked up solid in the middle. It would have done a better job anyway. But basically, this is the last joist. Then there's nothing. These floorboards are coming over and are loaded with the wall and everything going on upstairs and the traffic on the stairs, the stairs that are loaded under this wall and everything else like that. And then there's nothing over here until you get to this joist. Because this is all boxed out, but I bet you it's all hollow. I think somewhere, yeah, I was looking in there from the end, it's all hollow. So there's like a six foot at least, if I'm closer to seven foot swath on this side of the house that's completely compromised because some jackasses heater install forced air Ooh, forced air Ooh, i hate it so much i hate everything about it and the thing is you know you look i turn my light on and you look up there and it's like that goes all the way all the way up to the attic or something i mean it's not like and so i thought you know it's just that's the end of that hot air i was hoping it was maybe to the living room we could get it somewhere else and just come through and obstruct it and pack that up solid uh, which would mean in the end that both of these two are just sitting there and installed, not doing anything. But they're full of electrical down here, uh, tangled through it and different things. So, I mean, my new plan, uh, 
I should put a new 2x8 on either side of this one. So it goes right on by there, and it goes right over here, and so that becomes the heavy uh, edge of this opening for this stairwell forevermore. Um, the wall really isn't built on that still. It's built on this three to four inches out here of the floorboards hanging, cantilevering off of this. But there really is no other way to do it because if I leave it hollow, I can use, it's, there's a name for it, I forget what it's called, but I can go from a 14 and a half inch wall uh, duct and turn this way and go out to the side one way or another and still pump heat in there from the main from the heat source wherever it comes in or whatever in the future. But cutting that right off, I can't send heat up there anymore. And then it starts, all of a sudden there's scope creep. I gotta find another place to install a heating duct all the way upstairs. Uh, you know, and it's like, try to imagine now if that's the easier way or the cheaper thing to do. And if I come down both sides of this, right over here, I've gotta scoot him over, which shouldn't be, I can't think of a reason why I can't just take what I need, two inches or something on this, and move it over that much, and go through behind it with that new stick, and leave it, I mean, again, whether I leave it there or not, it might have been a subfloor floor repair in the future on this project, to go with a different heat um, source. Forced air, and janky electrical, slowing me way down here, so. As far as right now, it's the end of the day. I'm gonna leave this to roll around in the back of my head and just walk away from it. I'm gonna do a little cursory cleanup. We got the garbages by the street for tomorrow pickup. I don't have any more bins to load this stuff into. The bigger stuff will get trundled out of here. Um, but the next time I have a clear garbage bin, I'll bring it down and load it up with those little things. Um, this is wildly improved over here. I'm just not ready to take that temporary load uh, bearing system away up from underneath it. So like I say, yeah, think about this, come back with a fresh mind, and see what I come up with to solve these issues. So stay tuned, uh, but this will be the end of this episode, I think. So thanks for watching, we'll see you.